In this video, I'm going to talk about the importance of transport systems, both for plants and animals. Blood is transported in the circulatory system for animals. So in, in the animals, we've got heart, which pumps blood from the arteries through the capillaries and then back to the heart for the veins. So there's these three actual structures you need to know, these, these blood vessels. First one are the arteries. They have very thick muscular walls. The reason why is because they're closest to the heart that's being pumped. And that means we have to withstand high pressures. So they have thick muscular walls that so don't rupture. Whereas the veins, they just carry blood back to the heart. And they have very thin muscular walls or thinner muscular walls because they have to withstand less pressure. Also, the arteries have more of an elastic layer. They're more bouncy because when the heart beats, it needs to be big. The, the lumen needs to change in size. Whereas if it's relaxed, it needs to become smaller to make sure the blood pressure is the same at all times. And that means we need to have more of an elastic layer in arteries. Whereas the veins, again, they're far further away from the actual heart, so they have less elastic layer because they just can keep the same shape, same shape the whole time. They don't have to change shape. Right? And then with the capillaries, these are the ones in the middle. The capillaries, they have very small lumen, so they're very tiny. And that's because all they need to do is they need to slow down the actual movement of blood and they need to make sure that you can actually have nutrients diffused from the blood into cells. That means they have to be very small in shape and have a very small thin membrane to make sure that can happen. Right? So you need to know a bit about arteries, veins, and capillaries, but I also need to know about what blood actually is. So in blood, we can find different types of components. For example, red blood cells, which are often given to patients of anemia because red blood cells carry oxygen. And people with anemia don't have enough um, red blood cells, which means they get tired easily. We've got platelets as well. These platelets are cells which are needed for um, basically stop bleeding, for clotting. So people who have platelet deficiencies would be given platelets. And we've got plasma as well. This is where we have the watery component, which is important for people who have coagulation deficiency problems. And also we have white blood cells. This is given to patients who do chemotherapy to treat their cancer, because those people have weakened immune systems. So we give them extra white blood cells to make sure their actual immune system becomes stronger. Right? So these are different types of components on blood. But the one I want to focus on a bit more is plasma. Plasma is, again, mostly water. So it has water as these water molecules. but And that's plasma here. So about 60% of all blood is plasma. The rest is white blood, red blood cells and white blood cells and platelets. But of that plasma, most of that is water. But there's also some salts in there as well. The salts are dissolved as ions. So for example, NaCl will be Na plus or Cl minus. Those are the ions. We've got oxygen. It can travel in two forms, oxyhemoglobin and, car and dissolved oxygen. We've got carbon dioxide also in plasma. They, they can travel in three forms, either as carbamine and hemoglobin, as carbon and ions, or as dissolved in plasma. Nitrogenous waste can travel in the plasma as urea. Lipids can travel in the, plus, in the, in the blood as chylomicrons, which are protein. And glucose amino acids travel dissolved in plasma. Right? So we have plasma having all these different types of nutrients, which you need to get from and to cells. And they, can and they will change in terms of as the blood moves past the body. So for example, what I mean by change is oxygen goes into the actual blood at the lungs, whereas carbon dioxide leaves the actual blood at the lungs. Whereas at the cells, so any cell, we have carbon dioxide which enters the blood and we have oxygen leaving the blood. And we'll talk about why in a second. Then once we have, for example, blood moving past the digestive tract, we've got lipids and glucose and amino acids from our food coming into the blood at the digestive tract. At the liver, we have those nutrients, lipids, glucose and amino acids going into the liver. But we have, at the liver, we have urea being produced. Urea was nitrogenous waste that's pumped into the actual blood at the liver and then the, the urea will be removed at the kidneys. Right? So what you need to know is you, there's basically things happening as the blood moves past the body. Things go in and things go out. Right? The reason why we want to make sure we have oxygen coming into our blood at our lungs, and then at our blood, we want to make sure we have oxygen going into our cells. The reason being is called cellular respiration. Cellular respiration happens inside cells, and that's just the idea of energy production. So we actually need to have glucose, and then we need to have oxygen to be able to produce energy. And energy is important for, for example, um, cellular growth, repair, and maintenance. So without energy, our cells will not be able to survive, which means we will not be able to survive. So we have oxygen required for just normal function of our cells. And the good thing is we have one more mechanism that allows us to carry even more oxygen in our blood. That's all called hemoglobin, because hemoglobin allows oxygen to attach in red blood cells. So hemoglobin allows us to carry about 98 percent more oxygen than if we didn't have hemoglobin. And that's really important for, for example, mammals and birds, because they need lots of energy because they're such a big, big, big um, creature. So by having hemoglobin, it allows them to carry more oxygen, which means they can make even more energy and thereby increase their chance of survival. 
So that's for birds and mammals, we've got hemoglobin, and that's why we need oxygen for cell respiration. But the reason why we need to get carbon dioxide from our actual cells into blood is because when we do cell respiration, one byproduct, one waste product, is carbon dioxide. We can see we have carbon dioxide being produced here. And the problem with carbon dioxide is we have carbon dioxide that can react with water inside cells, and it's produced. So we've got cytoplasm full of water, and then we've got carbon dioxide being produced at the, at the actual organelles. That means that water in cytoplasm, the carbon dioxide can react together to form carbonic acid, and that can then dissociate to lower the pH. So what carbon dioxide does is lowers the pH. And that means enzymes in our actual cells stop working properly. And so that's why we need to get our actual carbon dioxide from our cells into the blood. And then when it gets to lungs, we want to make sure we exhale carbon dioxide so we can move it from the blood back into the lungs and then exhale it out. And you can test that happening because if you do the lime water test, you can basically get a test tube, add lime water, and then blow, use a straw to blow into it. And the actual lime water should change to a milky color. That's because carbon dioxide is present when you exhale, you exhale carbon dioxide out. And when you then check the pH of that water, you'll find that the pH is lower than seven because that the actual carbon dioxide has decreased the pH. Right? And that's why we want to remove carbon dioxide because it will basically stop our enzymes from working. It will denature those enzymes. I just briefly talked about the importance of hemoglobin and oxygen in our blood. And the reason why we're working on artificial blood now is because some people don't have enough of these hemoglobin or different types of components of the blood. So we're working on things that we can make in lab. For example, we've got the perfluorocarbon emulsions. What these do is they increase the amount of oxygen dissolved inside blood. But the problem is they're not perfect. They don't last very long and they don't, they're not as effective as normal hemoglobin. We're also, we also have these hemoglobin-based oxygen carriers. What they basically are is they're a modified hemoglobin from animal hemoglobin. And it's quite effective, but the problem is it's not being protected by red blood cell. Usually we've got hemoglobin inside red blood cells, whereas these HBOCs are not inside red blood cells. So they're not as protected, which means they don't last as long as normal hemoglobin does. Which means at the moment what we're trying to work on to make it even better is artificial hemoglobin. But that's, used, that's done using stem cell research. And what happens here is we have our own red blood cells being grown in a lab, which means we have hemoglobin inside the red blood cells, and we have that protection from the red blood cells. So once we can work on that, once we can make our own hemoglobin, you'll have much more um, better hemoglobin and much more better red blood cells in the future. And then we've got the saline solution, which we have basically replacing plasma. And you can see in a lab, or not a lab, in a hospital, you might have these saline solutions. So they're, again, they do similar things, functions to plasma and people who might be missing plasma will be given saline solutions. So these are some of the things we have or we're working towards. But the reason why we need to have artificial blood is because first of all, it will increase the amount of blood we have. We have a shortage of blood at the moment, so by making our own, we won't have a shortage anymore. Also, it'll last longer. Natural blood basically decomposes quite quickly, whereas artificial blood can basically last for a couple of years sometimes, or at least a couple of months. It's also much more sterile because we don't have, get it from humans. They don't have any diseases in the blood which means we don't have any risk of infection, infecting other people by accident. Also, we have no problem when it comes to cross-matching. Um, we have different blood groups, and if we give the wrong blood group to a person, that can cause massive problems, even death. So by making artificial blood, we won't have that problem. Right? So these were some of the reasons why we're working on artificial blood. In the previous few slides, I talked about how the transport system works in animals. Now I'll talk about plants. Plants don't have blood vessels, but they do have xylem and phloem. Xylem is where water and ions are transported. Phloem is where glucose is transported around the body. Xylem um, is called, the, how it works, it's called the transpirational pull, the mechanism of how water enters at the roots. So water enters at the roots and it does so through osmosis. That's the first step. Once water enters, it will go towards the stem. And at the stem, we've got cohesion and adhesion working. Cohesion means we have the water molecules basically hooked onto each other, so they're connected to, to each other. And adhesion means we have the water molecule hooked onto the side of the wall. And both these just make sure that water doesn't drop against gravity. So water is sticking on the actual set walls of that xylem tube. And then at the leaf, what's also happening, in the leaf we have a stomata, which is a small opening leaf, where actual water will evaporate, it will transpirate. And that means we have water loss. But because of that cohesion that we talked about earlier, these water molecules are all attached to each other. So when one water molecule escapes, basically it pulls on all the other ones, which are below it. And that's what causes a transpirational pull, a stream of water molecules from the bottom to the top. And that's how we can make, we have a constant supply of water throughout the actual tree. And all of this is passive, it doesn't require any energy. Whereas when it phloem, phloem we have got active transport. And the phloem, 
theory of how it moves is called translocation, which is basically that one thing starts at a sink, and it starts where it's produced, which is the leaf, and then it will move towards it where it's needed, for example, the roots or the stem. And it does so by first being produced at the leaf. Right? We've got glucose, which will be pumped from the leaf into the phloem tube, and it does so, the pumping happens through active transport. But then because there's more solid, because glucose is solid, because we have now more solid in the actual phloem, we will have water moving from the nearby xylem tube into the actual phloem tube. So now we've got lots of glucose and lots of water all in one space, which means there's a pressure buildup in the phloem tube, much pressure at the location of the source because of all the movement of water and glucose, which is, means now that, that actual glucose will move from the source, high pressure area, to a low pressure area, which is the actual, basically the sink, which would be the roots or the stem, because things just always move from high pressure to low pressure. And that's how we have it moving from the source to sink. And once it actually gets to sink, what's going to happen is that glucose will be pumped into sink through active transport. And because we have less solid in that tube now, less solid in a phloem tube, we will have water moving back through osmosis into the xylem. So water moves in at the top and it moves back down again into the xylem tube. And we have glucose entering the phloem tube at the source and leaving this, the phloem tube at the sink. And we've got, we had glucose moving from source to sink. All right, so that's how glucose moves, source to sink. Water moves through the idea of transpirational pool in xylem. And if you look at the actual and xylem and phloem, they're actually really close to each other. So we have the actual xylem in the inside of something called a vascular bundle and the phloem in the outside. And this basically allows us to have this happening where we have um, water moving from the xylem to the phloem because they're so close together, as you can see here, that this is possible, right? But these were just some of the actual mechanisms of how different substances move in plants through xylem and phloem. But all of this was just a quick overview of the concepts that I covered in the next couple of videos. So if you don't fully understand that, it's completely fine. This was just meant to give you a brief introduction to these different concepts. I hope that was useful.